and welcome to In Their Own Words, the story of the American experiment and the words of the women and men who made it happen. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Pete Fenzel, your host, and we're delighted that you chose to spend some time here with us. Today's episode involves treachery, betrayal, and treason. It involves seduction and death. <clears throat> so, it should be a lot of fun. I hope it is. It involves three main characters. One is Benedict Arnold, whose name is synonymous with traitor. A woman named Peggy Shippen, and a British officer named John Andre. <clears throat> Let's start with Arnold. Benedict Arnold was a peculiar man in that he had no moral compass whatsoever. He seemed to be under the belief that whatever he perceived as good for him was good and acceptable conduct, and whatever was not good for him was seen to be bad and worthy of resentment. He convinced George Washington that he should lead a small army, basically, to attack Quebec. It was a disastrous mission and the attack failed miserably. Arnold took a bullet in his left leg and eventually when reinforcements arrived from New England, he was superseded by the commanders of the, of the relieving force. And of course, he seethed with resentment of that. Arnold had a talent for alienating his commanding officers. He was chronically insubordinate and in his hunger to receive accolades for his conduct, uh, he seemed to belittle the accomplishments of those who were in command. And as a result, his commanders detested him strongly. Indeed, in the Battle of Saratoga, Arnold was under house arrest by General Gates, the commander. And Arnold sitting in his tent and, and hearing what was going on out in, on the field, decided to go grab a horse and go uh, and attack the British, which he did, and he led the decisive assault upon the British line, which won the battle. And in so doing, he took a bullet in the left thigh, and the horse fell on him as, as well, and, and, and really damaged his left leg even more thoroughly than before. So that with, ha with two bullet wounds plus the injury from the fallen horse, uh, he was crippled in his left leg and took many months of medical attention to recuperate. General Gates never mentioned Benedict Arnold in any of the dispatches or reports after this, uh, the Battle of Saratoga, and Arnold then seethed even more. General Washington, to uh, help Arnold recuperate, uh, appointed him as military governor of Philadelphia, a job he took over in June of 1778, shortly after the British withdrawal from the city. Am among the British troops who occupied Philadelphia before June of 1778 was Major John Andre, an extremely gifted and talented and courageous officer who was also the head of intelligence for the British Army as well as the adjutant general. Andre uh, had developed strong relationships with the Tory establishment in Philadelphia, including with a young woman named Peggy Shippen. <clears throat> now Peggy, at the time, was 17 years old. She was reputed to be the most lovely woman in all of Philadelphia. She was the daughter of an extremely wealthy Philadelphia merchant who was also a loyalist and uh, was one of the ranking members on the governing council. After the British withdrew from Philadelphia, Peggy and John Andre maintained their correspondence and she was asked to get to know Benedict Arnold, the commanding governor of Philadelphia, and she did the patriots of, on the Pennsylvania Council began to loathe Arnold's behavior. He lived a lavish lifestyle, consorting with the Tories, not with the patriots. 
And this dovetailed nicely into his relationship with Peggy Shippen, whom eventually he married in April of 1779. And immediately upon marrying her, opened up correspondence with Major John Andre of British Intelligence. Members of Congress and members of the Pennsylvania Council brought him up on charges of corruption. The officers at the court-martial simply recommended that he receive a letter of reprimand, which essentially mean, meant nothing, and Washington sent a letter of reprimand to Arnold. Now, Arnold seethed with resentment that Washington would do such a thing to him. Arnold was the great resenter, and this was the last straw. And so his negotiations for his treason with the British intensified. Peggy Shippen was the point person for British intelligence in order to secure Benedict Arnold's treason. Benedict Arnold sent a coded letter to Sir Henry Clinton. In that letter, he told the British about his appointment as commander of West Point. We have in the Library of Congress both the ciphered letter in code and the translation, which was written by the British. I have accepted the command at West Point as a post in which I can render the most essential services and which will be in my disposal. And the rest of the letter goes on demanding comp the compensation that had previously been negotiated at 20,000 pounds sterling, plus a general's commission in the British Army in payment for his betrayal of his country. As a result of Arnold's demand to meet with an intelligence officer, John Andre traveled up to Havistraw on the sloop Vulture to meet with Benedict Arnold and uh, received the plans to West Point. And so when he met with Andre in Havistraw on the night of the 21st of September of 1780, uh, he had already written out the, uh, the, the plans and the troop strengths uh, so that Andre could take that information back to New York. Now, the vulture was supposed to be Andre's ride back to New York City, where the British were garrisoned. But the sloop was fired on and had to retreat downriver a bit. And so Andre was kind of marooned over there in Rockland County. And so Benedict Arnold gave him civilian clothes and he wrote out a pass in the name of Mr. Anderson so that Andre could travel across to Tarrytown and get down into New York City through Westchester County. Well, when he made it to Tarrytown, uh, th three militiamen stopped Andre, and Andre, believing that they were Tories, told him who he was. They took his boots off and found the, the plans to West Point in the boots, and then realized that this was something much more significant than just stealing somebody's boots. The uh, plans for West Point were forwarded back to headquarters where Benjamin Talmadge, the uh, Continental Army's intelligence chief, uh, found them and was absolutely dismayed and shocked. Uh, at this point in time, word got back to Benedict Arnold through channels that uh, this stranger, Mr. Anderson, had been captured. And Arnold knew the jig was up, and Arnold made his escape to New York City. In the meantime, Poor John Andre was now no longer in his British uniform. He was in civilian clothes carrying the plans to the American Citadel at West Point and the troop strengths there. He was obviously a spy, and he was arrested and brought back to Tapan, New York, where he was held in close confinement at a tavern in, uh, in, in the little hamlet of Tapan called Maybe's Tavern. Now we're gonna go on a little road tour to Maybe's Tavern today and show you where Andre was held and where he was court-martialed and sentenced to death and where he was actually hung. We're on a little road trip here in Tapan, New York 
This is the 76 house, which back in 1780 was called Maybe's Tavern. This is the place where Major John Andre was held captive during his court martial as a spy for the treason of Benedict Arnold. Across the street behind me in that red brick church, that's the Reformed Church of Tapan. Its predecessor structure uh, was the place where the court martial occurred. That building was built in, 18, in 1834. So what happened was Andre was walked down these steps right here, went right across the street to his court martial. And then after he was convicted and sentenced to death, he was brought back here. And around five o'clock in the afternoon on October the 2nd of 1780, he walked down the steps that were right here, around the corner to Old Tapan Road there, and up the hill to his gallows. We're gonna go up now to Andre's Hill, where Andre was executed. Here we are on top of Andre's Hill in Tapan, New York. This is the precise spot where the gallows stood, where Major John Andre, uh, the intelligence chief of the British Army during the uh, revolution in 1780, was hung uh, after being condemned to death uh, by court-martial down the hill down in uh, the Reformed Church in Tapan. We're only about a third of a mile at most from the Reformed Church. His wagon carrying his coffin came up the hill and up here. Now, all of this land was farmland. It was under cultivation. There were no trees. Obviously, there were no suburban houses. But the wagon pulled up. There was a scaffold set up. They put the noose around his neck, asked him if he had any last words. And Andre said, nothing except I ask that you be witness to the world that I died like a brave man. And so they put a uh, handkerchief over his face, put the noose around his neck, and drove the wagon off, and he was hung to his death. And he died not like a brave man, but he died a brave man. Now, in, 17, in 1821, the, uh, the British came back to this site and exhumed the body of John Andre. And so his remains were removed from this spot right here and in, entombed in a place of honor in Westminster Abbey in London, where the heroes of Great Britain are forever remembered. What happened to Arnold after the betrayal of his country? Well, the scheme failed. West Point remained in American control. Then Arnold was transferred down to Virginia. There's an apocryphal story that after Arnold had burned parts of Richmond, he turned to a captured American officer and said, if the roles were reversed, what would you have done to me? And the young American officer is said to have replied, we would have cut off your leg, wounded at Saratoga, and buried it with full military honors. Then we would have hung the rest. There is a monument at Saratoga that has a picture of Arnold's left leg. It doesn't mention Arnold by name because of the contempt that the country had for the, this worst traitor at that time. But it's, it is still there as a testament to the patriotic left leg of Benedict Arnold. Well, after the Battle of Yorktown and the surrender of Cornwallis's army, it was plain that Arnold could not stay in the country any longer. So in December of 1781, he and his wife fled to London. He, uh, he would die in 1801, impoverished and loathed by friend and foe alike. Well, his, his poor wife, Peggy, she died three years later of cancer in a very painful way. And so the two Arnolds, one dying in her 40s and him dying at 60, uh, did not live a long life and did not live a happy life. And there was no happy ending for the Arnolds, which now brings us to the upshot of this entire story. It's really Major Andre that people are more interested about. He was an incredibly young man. He was an aristocrat, but the manner of 
the execution, shook the, the aristocratic societies of England and Europe. Just to put yourself in the shoes of a European for a second instead of American shoes. And the fact that Major Andre was not only convicted by a court-martial of common people, but also subjected to the ignominious death by hanging, the same thing you would do to a common thief. My God, that was revolutionary. And there is the whole point of this story. It's important that you know that there's a big difference between the Revolutionary War, which was a struggle for independence of the American state from the British crown, and the American Revolution, which itself was a reordering of society on an egalitarian basis consistent with the principles espoused in the Declaration of Independence. The war was an event. The revolution is a continuing process where we are constantly struggling to sustain a society where all people, regardless of their rank or their class or their power or their wealth, are entitled to the same rights and the same privileges as anybody else and are treated the same. And likewise, are subjected to the same laws and the same limitations and the same penalties. The American Revolution is still going on and we are still striving for that egalitarian ideal. And so to you younger Americans who are watching this, ask yourself a question. How well is the American Revolution doing today?